Good morning. I'm Linda Williams from Arizona State University. I'm really sorry I couldn't travel to be there with you in Istanbul this year, but it's a great honor to be asked to give the George Brindley Play Science Lecture after two years with no awards due to the pandemic. I hope you're all having a wonderful conference and that I'll see you in the near future. In this lecture, I plan to present my story of how play science has evolved during my 30 year career and hopefully will continue in new directions. Many of you have heard me lecture on our antibacterial clay research in the past, but I'll briefly present how that research began for those of you who have not heard the story. And then I wanna discuss the new directions yet to be explored. So I begin with the story of how I learned of and made some progress toward understanding what makes certain clays antibacterial and how we might gain insights from clay mineral microbe interactions for better drug designs. Our first paper on this topic in 2004 with Dennis Everill was titled Killer Clays, Natural Antibacterial Clay Minerals. But in reality, the clays are the good guys in this story. They kill bacterial pathogens and may lead us to develop new antibacterial mechanisms. So I'll begin the slideshow now, but I hope that any of you with questions or comments or ideas on how to pursue these new directions will contact me, Linda Williams at asu.edu. Thank you for your attention. The title of this lecture New Directions in Clay Science is about a medicinal application of antibacterial clays. I ended this with a question mark because although we've made a lot of progress in understanding what makes clays antibacterial, the application to medicinal purposes is still a work in progress. So I'll begin by talking briefly about uh, the French green clays and the Oregon blue clays that began this research. It was two decades ago that this woman, Lene Brune de Corso, contacted the Clay Mineral Society to find out if any mineralogists knew how clays kill Beruli ulcer. She was the wife of a French dip diplomat working in the Ivory Coast of Africa and noticed many people suffering from this flesh-eating disease. Having grown up in France, she had always put green clay on her wounds to heal them and so she imported that green clay from France to see if it healed this infection. She mixed the clay with local water and applied it as a poultice to the wounds, changing bandages daily. She used two different clays and one she described as strong. That clay caused skin damage after just a few days of treatment so then she would switch to a milder clay which allowed the wounds to heal over three months. These two different clays were from two different suppliers. No one in CMS replied to her query because we just didn't know anything about this Beruli ulcer infection. Then six months later, a second message came. Are there no clay scientists who care about poor people in Africa? Lean's hypothesis was that the clay was a fibrous form that was stabbing the bacterial cells like nanoscalpels and killing them. I wrote to her and said that I had access to electron microscopes, so at least I could image the minerals for them. These are SEM images, and the one on the right shows the Argicor clay, consisting of about 200 nanometer hexagonal plates, not fibrous nanoscalpels. So that caught my interest. Our approach to investigating antibacterial clays was to first determine the antibacterial effectiveness by identifying what kinds of bacteria were killed by the clay, then to determine which kinds of clays showed this antibacterial effect. The next important step is to determine the antibacterial mechanism. To do this, we look for a physical effect because some clays are attracted to bacterial surfaces and can kill by suffocation or cell disruption. Alternatively, there could be a chemical interaction where a toxic metal might be killing the bacteria, or perhaps the clay absorbs nutrients that the bacteria need to live. 
Among the antibacterial clays we've identified this far, the chemical mechanism seems to be dominant. Here's an example on the left of a cyanobacteria that has surface properties that attract the negatively charged clay particles that can suffocate cells. Ross Giza from SUNY Buffalo many years ago patented a clay that he synthesized to have such a large surface charge that the clay would physically tear bacterial membranes. So for the natural clays, you can measure the zeta potential of the bacteria relative to an antibacterial clay. The graph on the right shows an antibacterial clay with a negative potential at all pH values. The bacteria, shown here, B. subtilis and E. coli, have even lower potentials, indicating a 10 to 20 millivolt repulsion would occur between the bacteria and the clay surfaces. So in this case, a physical antibacterial mechanism was ruled out. Three methods for evaluating chemical interactions of clay with bacteria were used. First, it's important to sterilize the natural clays because they're full of environmental microbes that might interfere with the bacterial pathogen being tested. The sterilized clays mixed with bacteria in its growth medium the bacteria are grown to log phase about 10 to the seventh cells per milliliter. That's their most active growth phase. The, uh, then the, the clay bacteria suspension is incubated for 24 hours at 37 degrees and then spread on agar with growth media for plate counting. All of the um, natural bacteria are compared to controls, bacteria alone, and non-antibacterial clays. Examples of plate counting are shown at the bottom of the page. Uh, the argillettes and argicor on the right are the two clays from France. And you can see the argillettes has colony forming units growing. So it is not an antibacterial clay, whereas the argicor um, is antibacterial. We also did kill rate curves um, this was using bacteria grown to log phase, rinsed in deionized water, and then resuspended in isotonic sodium chloride, which is necessary um, so that the bacteria don't um, get killed from osmotic uh, swelling. Uh, then a rate of death is determined over time. Um, finally, we made aqueous leachates of the clay. Um, to, to see if soluble metals coming out of the clay would kill the bacteria directly. Lean Brunet used two French green clays, one from Argillettes and one from Argicor Incorporated. We tested both of these clays against a broad spectrum of bacteria, and the results are shown here. Um, first, the control is shown on the bottom uh, in the first column and then bacterial growth after 24 hours. And then the mixture with the Argicor and the Argillettes clays is shown for a variety of gram-negative bacteria and two uh, gram-positive bacteria, uh, including methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, shown on far right. So you can see that the Argillettes is not antibacterial, but the Argicor is. Uh, against all of the gram-negative bacteria where there is no growth. Um, the Argicor reduces the gram-positive bacteria by three orders of magnitude, which is, which is considered antibacterial. Um, all of these tests were performed in triplicate. This shows SEM images of E. coli before and after the treatment with clay. Healthy E. coli have pili, which are these uh, little hairy fibers growing off of them. And after clay incubation, you can see the texture of the cell membrane, this is E. coli, uh, is um, very uh, brainy texture. It's clearly been damaged uh, after six hours of incubation with uh, the aqueous leachates of the clay in this case. One thing we've also learned is that size of the clay fraction matters. 
For some samples, the detrital minerals dilute the antibacterial elements. In this case, we found that the less than 0.2 micron argicor clay was bactericidal, while the coarser fractions were not. The small fraction is more prone to dissolution. We compared the mineralogy of the two French green clays because the argillets was not antibacterial and the argicor is antibacterial. Suspensions of these clays showed a pH of 8 for the argillets and a pH of 10 for the argicor. The mineralogy is shown on the left, the y-axis, and the weight percent across the bottom on the x-axis. Uh, the main difference is basically the iron smectite is much higher in the argicor antibacterial clay and, uh, compared to the argillets clay. And also of importance that is that the argillets contains a lot more calcite, which reflects the circumneutral pH. Two important lessons were learned from the French green clay study. The first is that only clay that buffers the pH to greater than 10 was antibacterial. At pH 10, aluminum is soluble, and at pH 8, aluminum is stable. Second, we found that only the less than 0.2 micron size fraction of the clay was antibacterial. This is because small crystals have high relative surface area, possibly increasing the mineral solubility. We looked for the geologic source of the French green clay sold by Argicor, but the company did not reveal that location. So we studied many other clays reported to be antibacterial. Most were not, but one of the clays sold online from Oregon turned out to kill every bacterial pathogen common in hospital settings. This deposit was not significantly disrupted by mining, so we set out to study this reduced iron blue clay from Oregon in detail. The Oregon blue clay deposit is in Douglas County, Oregon, in the Cascades, about 30 kilometers west of Crater Lake, but the volcanics associated with this deposit are about 30 million years older than Crater Lake volcanics. The deposit is an open pit mine in clays that formed along the Foster Creek fault line shown here, and they are hydrothermally altered and acidic materials. Here is a picture of the blue clay, very striking blue uh, when it's in the field and in contrast with the yellow of sulfur crystals that are the size of your hand. It's a reduced iron that makes the clay blue. This is a dissertation topic of Keith Morrison, who graduated in 2015 and has written a, no a number of papers on this deposit. Uh, in the upper right, you'll see the andesite uh, porphyry, uh, which is uh, a solid, but in the images B and C below, the samples are clay and it crumbles in your hand. The geologic setting is that of an argillic alteration associated with a volcanogenic epithermal mineral deposit. We have mapped this deposit and have identified the mineral assemblages associated with intermediate sulfidation. The alteration minerals are primarily illite smectite, pyrite, quartz, and plagioclase. And oxygen isotopes have pinned the alteration temperatures between 150 to 300 degrees centigrade. The pH is controlled by the hydrolysis of pyrite, generating acidic conditions between pH 2 and 5. We worked with infectious disease researchers at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota to test this blue clay against a broad spectrum of pathogens in their library, many of which are drug resistant. The results of this testing on planktonic or free floating bacteria in vitro are shown here. 
At the top are results of gram-positive species, and these time-kill curves show that all of these different species are depleted in uh, within 24 hours, as early as four hours. The clay leachate shown by the green triangles are also depleting these bacteria compared to the controls shown in blue. The gram-negative species at the bottom show similar results. The clay mineralogy of this deposit was first identified by Dennis Everill, and while the miners assumed that the clay was dominantly pyrophyllite, it turned out to be rectorite of 50-50 ordered elite smectite. Another interesting thing about the Oregon blue clay is it has two different morphologies of iron sulfide. In the upper left, you see a chalcopyrite crystal. This, they can be 25 to 50 microns in diameter, whereas there are small, less than one micron um, iron sulfides shown on the upper right. It looks like a cell, a bacterial cell, if, um, and there are many of these, these small uh, bacteria-shaped sulfides in the deposit. On the lower left, you can see the spheres. Those are iron sulfide in a cluster of clays, which are primarily rectorite. Interestingly, the, uh, the coarse pyrite in the sample is not antibacterial, but if you separate out the less than one micron fraction, it is antibacterial. Keith Morrison studied the antibacterial activity related to the oxidation state by taking a cross-section here with depth in the clay deposit. Uh, on the right, you see the percent pyrite uh, from zero at the top to 9% at the bottom where there's stock work of quartz and pyrite, which is not antibacterial, by the way. But the clay is inhibitory at depth. But most bactericidal uh, where the oxidation state is higher. The EH is shown here on the right um, with increasing EH from 400 to over 600 millivolts uh, as you approach the surface of the sample. And the, the more um, bactericidal samples are found in the higher oxidation state. There's a fault over on the left which is white clay, which is mostly smectite, and there's no pyrite in that fault zone. Uh, but it is also uh, inhibitory to bacterial growth. In this study, Keith used zone of bacterial growth inhibition, shown over on the left, to quickly determine the antibacterial effectiveness across many samples in this antibacterial deposit. These plots show the effectiveness against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Measurements of iron and aluminum in the solutions equilibrated with the clay show a correlation of antibacterial effect and their concentration. Furthermore, the levels of hydrogen peroxide follow the same trend. The takeaway message is that metal solubility correlates with antibacterial effectiveness. This plot of aluminum solubility shows that it's highest at pH less than 5 and greater than 9, where we have found antibacterial clays. In the physiological pH range, aluminum is more stable, and both iron-3 and aluminum-3 will precipitate. So clays with circumneutral pH tend not to be antibacterial. Here's an example of many of the clays that we studied. The antibacterial clays that are acidic are shown in blue, and those that are alkaline are shown in green. And many clays that we've studied are not antibacterial because they're in the pH range uh, from 5 to 9. Keith Morrison compared the effectiveness of aqueous leachates of the blue clay against suspensions of clay and water. Using hydrogen peroxide production as an indication of the antibacterial effect, he showed that the metals in water alone 
are not antibacterial for long, but in the presence of rectorite, the peroxide production extends over 24 hours. His interpretation is that reduced iron in the expandable clay interlayer is slowly released and hydrolyzed producing iron 3 plus that interacts with the submicron pyrite, setting up a redox cycle that generates peroxide and hydroxyl radicals through the Fenton reaction series. These are the active ingredients in the antibacterial mechanism. Working with Mayo Clinic researchers, we wanted to know if the Oregon blue clay was effective against biofilms that are most common in wounds and are more resistant to antibiotics. Biofilms form when the planktonic bacteria attach to a substrate and grow into a film as shown here. Mayo Clinic grew biofilms of the bacterial pathogens previously tested in planktonic form and results shown here indicate that compared to the control, which is bacteria without clay, the blue clay shown in blue was antibacterial for both gram-negative and gram-positive species, including MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Aqueous leachates were less effective but still reduced the bacterial populations. We conducted time kill curves on methicillin resistant Staph aureus to determine how long it took for the bacteria to die compared to bacteria in water buffered to the pH of the clay water suspensions. This shows the control is the MRSA bacteria. Bacteriostatic growth occurred using the leachate alone, but the blue clay, shown in blue, killed the bacteria in about eight hours. TEM imaging of E. coli cells reacted with the blue clay show a time series of cell death. Initially, the cells are spherical. This is a common reaction to acidic conditions. After an hour and B, the cells begin to show black particles accumulating at their polar ends. C shows that they become more concentrated at the polar ends after six hours. And then D, at 24 hours, shows when the cell dies, the black particles appear in the intracellular space. Note that the white void in the cytoplasm are where phosphates have been plucked out during sample prep. So what are these black precipitates? Keith used scanning transmission electron energy loss to examine the composition of the precipitates. In these images, the black particles from TEM appear white. The spectral analysis shows that the white particles are iron 3 plus. This suggests that hydroxyl radicals from the Fenton reactions, which only exist for nanoseconds and diffuse only nanometers before reacting, must be entering through the cell membrane before reacting with biomolecules and precipitating iron oxides inside the cells. We use secondary ion mass spectrometry to image aluminum and iron in E. coli treated with the Oregon blue clay and another antibacterial clay from the Amazon studied by my student Carolina Londonio. On the left is an image of E. coli shown in the lower left is the carbon image. The aluminum is shown in yellow and the iron is shown in red. And clearly aluminum stays on the outsides of the cells and iron goes into the cells. On the right, Carolina studied a single cell in the cross section and uh, the graphs below it in B and C show aluminum over CN and iron over CN and you can see that there is high aluminum on the cell walls or exterior and in the interior there is high iron compared to a control which is shown in blue that was not treated with antibacterial clay. 
This EH-PH diagram shows the stability fields for iron 2 plus, and the circled areas indicate the range for the natural antibacterial clays we've identified, as well as a synthetic antibacterial clay that Keith Morrison reported on this year in Nature Scientific Reports. Clearly, as the pH and EH are out of the stability field for iron 2 plus, the clays are no longer antibacterial. So that is a critical parameter for the success of clay in, an, in a wound environment. Our partners at Mayo Clinic performed the first animal trials of the Oregon blue clay on Wistar mice. The mice were prepared using a punch biopsy about 5 millimeters in diameter infected with methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. Results of five separate animal trials using different doses were compared to untreated infections and treatments with Vaseline, Bacitracin, the Oregon blue clay, and an unoxidized red clay that is not antibacterial. Unfortunately, none of these experiments showed any effectiveness of the Oregon blue clay in vivo. We tested four hypotheses for why the blue clay was not effective in MRSA infected wounds when it worked so well in planktonic and biofilm experiments in vitro. Was the pH or EH out of the stability field for iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus solubility? Were these reactants complexing with compounds in the wound fluids? Was the clay drying out and limiting aqueous reactions? And was the supply of oxygen diminished relative to the in vitro experiments? In vitro, we showed that the pH and EH of the Oregon blue clay suspension was variable over time, but stayed in the solubility range for iron 2 plus and aluminum 3 plus. We also tested the pH and EH before and after interaction with MRSA and found a slight EH reduction after 24 hours interaction, but still in the iron 2 plus and aluminum 3 plus um, stability fields. Next, we tested whether simulated wound fluid impaired the blue clay effectiveness. The wound fluid consisted of 50% fetal calf serum, 0.9% sodium chloride, and 0.1% peptone. The results, compared to untreated bacteria and the non-antibacterial red clay, showed that the blue reduced iron clay was still effective even in the presence of sheep blood. However, when we tested MRSA biofilms with components of wound fluid and blood, there was a reduction in the antibacterial effect of the blue clay. It showed only about three log units reduction in colony forming units in the presence of blood and fetal calf serum. The hydration state was tested by adding hydrogel made of xanthan gum on top of the clay suspension in vivo. These tests showed that the hydrogel did not impede the antibacterial effect of the blue clay, and it did not change the pH and the EH significantly. Finally, we found that the oxidation state of the blue clay is significantly reduced after incubation with MRSA in simulated wound fluid, but the pH range was unchanged. Notably, fetal calf serum, which is the main component of the simulated wound fluid, contains ferritin, which is a complex protein that regulates iron in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. At this point in our research, there are three main conclusions. First is that colony biofilms of pathogens, including drug-resistant bacteria, are killed by reduced iron clay in vitro. The antibacterial clay tested was not effective on mouse wounds infected with MRSA. Complexation of reactants with wound components best explains the in vivo inhibition of the antibacterial clay mechanism. So where do we go from here? 
The reduction of the blue clay after treatment in vivo indicates oxidation by my biomolecules, and the most likely candidate is called ferritin, which takes up the reduced iron generated by the blue clay. At certain enzyme sites in the protein cage, the iron is reversibly oxidized to form ferrihydrate. When cells need iron for energy, the iron is then released from these sites. This is my new hypothesis of why the highly effective antibacterial clay tested in vitro is not effective in vi vivo. The eukaryotic ferritin produced in the mouse wounds appears to be more effective at sequestering iron 2 plus than the bacterial ferritin that was present for in vivo experiments. The new directions this research must take require a far better understanding of the biochemistry of wound environments than I have as a clay mineralogist. But this is where new directions in clay science become critical. The most important new discoveries will come from our communication of such exciting results as we have found in our antibacterial clay research to specialists in other fields. I have great hope that we can find ways to inhibit the action of ferritins so that natural antibacterial mechanism of reduced iron clay can be perfected for medicinal applications to infectious diseases. Thank you for your attention.